really going to get back to old, old, old times. Not only didn't we have that, but I'm sure Shakespeare and Wagner didn't have to put up with that nonsense either. Somebody reviewing their book and putting it down and like nobody buys a new Shakespeare novel because it's like uh, Pete Johnson gave it a bad review or Cleveland Amor, I didn't like it. So I don't know. So, what? Uh, well, as long as we're into the historical uh, describe how you got into producing. You were first a uh, musician with the teddy bears. Yeah, it was accidental. I really, I, I, I just had an idea for the song, you know, I'm slow, and then I just went and recorded it. Then, and then I became a court reporter, and I went to work for the United Nations in New York. I knew some other languages, and I was able to get a good job. And on my way there, when I got off the plane, I saw the city, man, and it just intrigued me to no end. And I, just, and I said, you know, this is where it's at. And I met some people in the music industry, and um, I just listened for a while and watched and was careful. But uh, I made a lot of records that were hits that I didn't put my name on because I couldn't. And I took the three hundred dollars and ate for a month, rather than whoever my name on the record. And some other cat got the producing credit, and I didn't care, because I knew the people in the business would find out, you know. And that that was all I really cared about. But um, Archie Blyer was the guy who intrigued me the most. I was m most influenced, I guess, by him. And then um, before I had a chance to absorb Lieber and Stoller as great um, producers, whom I could be influenced by, I became involved with them. So I sort of like think it was to just get better than them rather than to be influenced by them. Because I knew I was influenced by them, but I didn't give it a chance to work because I was, you know, working for them at that time. So I couldn't really sit around and worry about what they were doing. I had to get going, you know, and move. Whereas Archie Blair was already getting out of the industry at that time. And he was like, he had done something that nobody else had done before. He had started his own record company, which even when I started, it was a very dangerous thing to do in those days. Because it still is, which is why you find nobody starting independent record companies anymore. Everybody gives their masters to a company because you can't collect your money, which is the old story of the record game. But that's the only way you can maintain any authority. And today with these people, I mean, Electra Records is a freak. And uh, A&M is a freak. And Atlantic is a freak. They're not, because they got so big now I don't mean Electra, but I mean A&M and Atlantic, so big now that they don't have to worry about the nonsense idiotic managers that come in and destroy the rapport between creative producer and creative group by money and stuff, because they have, they'll, they'll tolerate it, because they, they have businessmen on down the rows who can take care of all that nonsense. They've got 70, 80 people working for them. Myself, I could never be tolerated. I'm worried about, you know, 300,000 accounts receivables sitting out there. I can't some manager calling me on the phone telling me, you know, Listen, you're not giving my, I want an album with strings, you know, and uh, you got to give us, I said, listen, you know. Then I found out when we were recording a group in New York, I got to mention the group, I mean, we had about 11 million records we saw. I only mentioned No Magic Group because I, I made a promise I was going to produce this group and never tell anybody, and that's the way it's been. Well, I saw about 11 million records in a year with this group. They were a phenomenal group. And then the lead singer quit, quit the group, and I said, gee, I didn't want to quit the group making all this bread. And then he came to me and said, Phil, he said, listen, let me tell you something, man. He said, I gets me $100 a week. I said, what? He said, I gets no royalty. I gets no money. He said, I gets me $100 a week, everything. He said, well, who gets the royalty? He said, my man is it. I said, really? I said, shocking. And you know, now, at any, now, if you own your own record company, which is, this was later on I did, I said, how will I ever prevent this kind of nonsense, you know? Because the manager will say, Spectre's stealing. No, no, I don't have any administrators, you know. I'm working in a little room, keeping all this money to myself, building, building, building all this accounts, collecting in the millions of dollars of building up in the bank accounts. I don't know what. Then some guy will come along and say, Spectre, you're cheating us, you're robbing us. And I can't pass them on to my executive vice president or my third vice president because I got my own. So I said, well, that's, you know, you know, independent record business is just, you know just doesn't pay. And at the same time, if you're a creative record producer, you really don't want to give in to these managers who just want to feed themselves, you know, off of, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 asking for a group. It's just absurd. And 14% and this and that and this and that. I mean, it was like the old excise tax. You used to have to pay an excise tax to the government on what you build, not what you received. So if you build $200,000, you had to give the government 10% of that. But you may have only collected 60000 of that. 
So like, but you can't really fight Uncle Sam because say, I don't want to do it and you're out of business. But with a manager, you're just not going to give in to that nonsense. We're going to do our own cover. We're, oh, yeah, well, I'll see you later. You know, forget it. You know, you don't need me to make hit records. It's obvious. But two, three years later, always come back. Always come back. I mean, I experienced this with, and I have no regrets against really the people involved, and I love all the groups that I dealt with, but I had this with people, not necessarily only the managers, people involved with the Spoonful, people involved with the Young Rascals, people involved even with the airplane before they formed the other group, that Matthew Katz. Remember him? Now, he had not, that fool was put out of it. They threw him out because they knew he was a moron. And practically all the people that eventually negotiated with him in the beginning were eventually discarded by the groups. And because um, they saw that they were just leeches living off this. Uh, and the groups get crazy too, you know. But, uh, and I even think the record business is going through a whole change now, which is why I think you have the situation of the moms and the papas breaking up or John Sebastian leaving the spoonful. Uh, the cream breaking up, the stones talking about it, uh, getting rid of this one, that one. Because they don't really, you know, they can't turn to each other because they're too close to each other. They can't be objective anymore. And either they start fighting, and there's nobody strong enough to get in. And a couple of years ago, a manager who was strong enough would prevent anybody like myself from getting in because they they'd be frightened that they eventually get kicked out. So I didn't get involved, but they got kicked out anyway, you know, because the group eventually turned on them. But I think there's a tremendous thing of a uh, tremendous ego thing going on in the record industry right now, where everybody wants to get their recognition due them. And uh, I mean, in what era would you find so many groups breaking up with the lead singer saying, hell, it's easy to make hit records. We ain't going our own. We don't need it. You, boy, 10 years ago, you see groups starving out in front of New York with them guitars begging you to record them. And then when they got a hit, They'd have fights with each other. I mean, fish fights in their room. But leave that group, you had to break them. Like, you had to take this guy who was the lead singer of this group. After 11 million records, he finally quit making 100 a week. <laughs> he finally said, oh, I had enough of this, you know. And he didn't even know. He just, you know, finally he couldn't, you know, he said, yeah, must, something must be wrong. I should be having it. Everybody's telling me how rich I am. I ain't got no money in my pocket. So, okay, but you never had it so easy where people could just go out and... Uh, and make a hit, which it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it, but it shows that there's something happening in the record industry. And judging by the phone calls I've gotten recently, though I'm retired, I can see this tremendous searching going on for... People say, well, you talk about this, you're a big ego. Yeah, big, big ego. Because I know what I am, I know where I'm at, and if they don't, I'll say, I can tell you. But you don't go call Babe Ruth and then say, hey, Babe, bat, we need you to bunt next inning. You know, he said, what is that? I ain't, I'm a home, I'm going to hit the home run. No, bunt the boy. Screw, I ain't going to be on this team no more. You're going to quit. That's exactly the way I look at these groups that come in. I said, well, now you finally realize that what you think is easy, you don't want. And what you want, you're going to have to give a little bit up and you're going to have to take some direction. Yes, it's easy to go in and record. Da, 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 da. Especially if you're recording it not to be a single, and for an album, it's a lot easier. In other words, easy to give away something you don't want. You know, here, have a piece of this cake. I don't, uh, don't tell me I don't like it, though. So then when they say they really want to do something that's from here and also acceptable commercially, then they got to go to somebody who works from here and understands commerciality at the same time. So that's where the problem starts. They want to be commercial, and at the same time, they want to come from here. That's what blew Roy Orbison. He thought MGM had get the answer. He wasn't doing what he wanted to do. That's what blew Mary Wells. That's what will blow the, blew the Righteous Brothers. And they don't understand that, you know, they have to eventually look. They eventually come back to it. I've talked to group members from all the groups, and they all said the same thing. If I want you to come down and listen to us edit this new album, uh, we're just editing tonight. Uh, oh, are you really? Yeah, just edit. Uh, just come down, you know. And then when I get there, look, are you, uh, uh, and you really can't. I said, look, I don't understand. You know, how can I just come in and, and, and start running your store for you? I can't do that, you know. Oh, well, we just want to see if you I love it. I love it. I think it's great. It's fantastic. Put it out tomorrow. Let the kids. You sell it. Sell it. Teeny barbers are waiting for it, man. It's out of sight, you know. You know, the guitar may be too loud. It isn't. I've heard people rave about studios, you know, and rave. And rave. You ought to hear this studio. I go, well, here's the studio, you know. I like my speaker system at the house. It's a lot, you know, <laughs> a lot better, you know, and it costs me a lot less, you know. But everybody is really, you know, 
because the standards are a lot lower. You just don't have to do it as well. And then when the group members decide, well, pretty soon the lead singer, the doors will say, hey, well, how come, you know, the same old, we had this in 1958 too. How come I got to split my royalties up four ways? Okay, <laughs> that's fine too. Then he leaves and then he says, well, I want to do the same thing I was doing with the doors. I want to do something different. Ah, so I, I got to need a record producer. That's when the change happens. When the group either wants to make a change or the lead singer leaves the group and wants to make it on his own and he says, yeah, I could go in and sing that song. That's not really what I want to do. Then you either got to tell them, hey, what you want to do is wrong or what you want to do is right and here's how to do it. But there's a compromise that, that they don't understand. They just don't know what direction to go in. And they really, not so, an artist shouldn't have to worry about anything but doing their, their thing. And the other artist, the producer, should worry about his thing. Painter shouldn't worry about the price. I mean, that's not his job. He should have his agent come in and say, I think I can get X number of dollars for this. And uh, the record industry, I mean, the men like Doc Palmas who wrote great songs. Now, Doc wrote Save the Last Dance for me when he was 37 years old. At 42, he's still the same man he was at 30. So in other words, he was never a young teeny bopper. So now they look at him and say, oh man, you know, nobody wants to hear that junk anymore. And you're not with it anymore. And his answer is, I was never really with it. If I was 37 when I wrote it, how could I be any different, less with it, you know, a few years later? And they said, yeah, but, you know, Save the Last Dance for me. And I was talking to one publisher, I said, hey man, you know, he wrote Save the Last Dance for me. I said, he said, yeah, but that was then, you know, anybody could write hits during those days. I said, yeah, but he never danced. He said, what do you mean? Said, he's crippled. He's never walked. I said, oh, yeah, gee, well, that's, he's, you know, that's very interesting. You know, thanks for telling. I mean, don't you realize that the guy didn't have to dance to write a song about dancing? He don't have to be 25 to understand the compassion, the problem of a 25. He don't have to be colored to understand the problem of the nigger down south. You know what I mean? They don't understand that. They t that's, you know, wait just a minute.